A lot. So we're, we're now going to move into our uh, Q&A. Um, and again, these are questions that we really appreciate those of you who um, had the opportunity to, to uh, complete the RSVP survey. Um, so we, we looked through all of the different questions and we definitely found some questions that were appearing more than once and we, we kind of um, put the sort of theme based uh, questions. Um, and so we'll go through um, as many of those as we can now. Um, and uh, some of the questions I'll answer, some Dr. Dew will answer, and I think we'll have some where we might we turn over to, um, to Eva and Peggy as well. Um, so the first question, um, this was the one that I think comes up the most often, and hopefully you feel like it's been answered today, but the first question was, what is the timeline for secondary planning? So just to re reiterate that again, um, the plan is 2022 for opening middle school, and again, we think of middle school as grades six through eight, um, and then 2025 for high school. So we thinking about high school as grades nine through 12. So 2022 and 2025. And the second question, um, so do you plan to continue to offer the LEAD program through secondary? So yes, we support the idea and see it as a, a natural extension. So we, we, you know, we see LEAD as part of, as part of DSHK. Um, it is important, though, that you know that we consider all of the different uh, issues that are required to make sure that we're really careful in our planning. So we want to make sure that our program objectives are are very clear, um, and that we you know promote a really balanced approach that balances both academic success, but also those really important you know independent life skills that will set up each each student for you know those, that kind of positive uh, end pathway. All right. So the next question, I think I'll turn actually over to Eva. So the question is, um, what is the real estate campus strategy? Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, I think our current campus has a long lease of 12 years and we are into our fourth year. We still have two thirds to go. So that gives us a bit of time to uh, plan for a permanent campus. In fact, it has always been out at a goal to have a permanent school campus. And we are working on uh, various options and uh, including uh, actively bidding for government size. And uh, I can tell you that we are really pushing ahead this uh, in full speed. And I hope we can uh, give you good news in the future. And of course, we also have backup plans like we are thinking of collaborating or taking over private size uh, if we can find a suitable partner. Uh, or our site owner. Uh, we are exploring various uh, options. And uh, at the same time, I think our current campus still has uh, about maybe 15% of space that is not put to use. So uh, Sean just uh, mentioned about uh, the capital annual fund. So this is something that I think uh, we will work on it in the near future uh, because we can still do a lot of things in improving the existing campus by initiating various uh, minor or, or major improvement projects. All right, thank you, Eva. So next one, Dr. Du. Dew.下面这个问题呢，是有家长问哈，说道尔顿呢是否会考虑。以简体字代替繁体字啊，呃，那这个问题呢，呃，我们是这样考虑的啊，我们在那个建校之初哈，呃，其实呃，非常严肃认真的思考了这个问题啊，那后来学校呃决定采用繁体字，呃，我们有这
呃呃，在这样的呃。后面的一些啊、呃、时间、一些年里面哈，让我们孩子真正有机会再把这个繁体字的这种文化内涵的东西打好坚实的基础。呃，一旦我们的孩子呃从繁体字转到简体字的时候，很多家长也跟我们分享了这样的想法，其实呃要容易的很多。但是相反，如果从呃简体转繁体，可能要复杂的多哈。那刚才呢，在介绍的时候，上也提到了哈、啊，呃，我们很快呃，可能就要开我们的中学了啊，呃，现在呢，我们计划有这样一个选择哈、啊，呃，我们的小学从一年级到五年级，我们还是呃用繁体字，但是从中学开始啊、呃，我们给孩子选择，他可以选繁体字和简体字，这样呢，一方面可以嗯。呃呃，就是延续哈我们这个繁体字的这样一些文化的传承。呃，另外一方面，如果有些小朋友他需要呃准备一些呃用简体字进行的考试哈啊，那他可以做好充分的准备啊。所以目前呢，这是我们学校的呃这样的一些考量。呃，但是未来啊、呃，如果我们呃看这个社会的发展啊、呃，根据家长的需要。呃，根据学生的学习的状况，呃，我们发现，嗯、呃，如果有这个，呃，呃，有这个必要，我们再来重新讨论这个问题的时候，我们愿也愿意，呃，来再征求家长的意见，然后尤其是呃，通过观察我们的小朋友，我们会找到一个呃最适合我们的学生的这样的一个学习的方式和这个字体的选择。All right, thank you. Um, so the next question is, how do you evaluate and benchmark effectiveness of DSHK instructional program against other international schools? So this is a great question. So I would say that there are really three main ways um, that we help ensure the kind of the quality of our instructional program. Um, number one is definitely through assessment. Um, and so in that, in that assessment can look at in a lot of different ways. So school-based, we use a variety of formal and informal assessments to help make sure that each individual child um, is performing where they need to be performing and that we can see exactly where they are against grade level standards. Beyond that though, we also do make use of some standardized assessments. So beginning in grade three, that's where we start to use the math assessment, uh, which is a English reading and math assessment, which also gives us data not only on individual students, but how they are performing against um, students around the world. Um, and that's true also in Chinese. We have something called level Chinese. I think many of you are likely familiar with that. Um, that also gives us information about the individual child, but also gives us a sense of how students are doing against, um, against their peers at other schools. Um, and so it's, again, that really that having a really kind of comprehensive assessment practices to help make sure that children are, you know, so we can really determine where each child is, um, you know, grow them where they need to grow, um, and see exactly how well the kind of the instructional program is going. Um, a second way, though, is through our CIS accreditation process. So CIS, you know, the Council for International Schools, is an evaluation body. Um, and so already we have achieved membership in, within our first four years. And so now we're moving towards accreditation, which is a very rigorous process. And you only are granted accreditation you know, if you can meet certain criteria. So it's another way that can really help make, us, make sure that the things that DSHK is doing instructionally are really at the highest level. Um, and I think a third way um, is through things like, uh, you know, competition, friendly types of competitions. Um, so in the spring, you know, you see our, st our students are participating in the, in the Feng Sakai Art and Writing Competition. Um, but there's so many other ways, you know, we, we can expand that to different types of academic competitions, um, arts competitions. Ms. Carmen had the soccer team all ready to go for, ready to, for league play, but unfortunately the, you know, the pandemic has put that on pause. Um, but giving our students opportunities to be able to do things um, with you know, their peers that are outside of the, the school, I think also helps us kind of see kind of how, how DSHK is doing. Okay, and the next question is, what is the plan for sports and expanded outdoor education? Um, so first of all, let me just say that we do really value um, sports and see it as a, you know, a, an important part of, of character education. Um, so some short-term things. Um, so this year we are working with an organization called Dragonfly. Um, and so we actually have some uh, excursions planned in, in May uh, where students are going to be doing some outdoor education. But the thing that we like about Dragonfly is they combine those outdoor experiences with some very um, specific character lessons. Um, in addition to that, something that we've been able to add over these four years, uh, unfortunately this year this has been a challenge, but um, you know, we have regular use of the Olympic 
uh, soccer pitch, um, as well as the Calum Park pool. So these are both things that allow us to do, you know, the outdoor things that we want to do, while also be, like, and also being able to do things like swimming lessons. So hopefully, as soon as we get the, the green light uh, from you know, EDB and the CHP, we can go back to, to using those facilities. Um, and then lastly, um, Ms. Carmen has a goal to be able to add a new team sport each semester. So we've added soccer. Um, I know that she's working on um, uh, netball next. Um, so different types of sports each semester that we will be, be adding. Obviously, we'll help you with the, with the input from students. Um, so those are different things that we're planning to do um, in the short term. But as we start to think now ahead more into the long term, uh, we do want to continue to add more team and individual sports. Um, I know Peggy's very passionate about us someday having a, a sailing team, um, but also you know, making sure because we are a smaller school, um, giving students a lot of those individual sport opportunities. So we are starting to work with a, a new organization that specializes in some very unique sports like fencing and golf. Um, so different things that, that students might actually um, develop a love for. And these are also sports that they might be able to do um, you know, for their whole life. All right, um, two more questions. So the next one is, um, what type of experiential learning opportunities do you plan to provide to students? So example, like study abroad options as they get older. So we are definitely deeply committed to experiential learning and hopefully that's something that you've already been able to see in the, in the primary years because we really do try to make sure that those experiential learning um, opportunities are aligned with what students are doing um, instructionally, um, but also with their interests and, and their passions because they are aligned with those inquiry topics. Um, but we do, but again, we, we, we don't see our experiential learning as like kind of a cookie cutter, one size fits all, but instead something that really helps enhance the individual learning experience. So say three ways that we see us, you know, kind of expanding experiential learning, particularly as students get older. Um, the first would be to continue this emphasis on class trips. Those, so those class trips that are, you know, inquiry and student driven, um, that are based on the themes and topics that students are studying. The second though, and this would be as students get older, um, we really believe in the concept of volunteerism. And so when we think about global citizens and service learning, um, giving students an opportunity to go outside of Hong Kong um, and do some volunteer work while also getting to visit a new place. And so this is something that we are really excited to add on um, as our students um, get older. Um, and then a third way um, is through competitions. Um, we wanna be able to support our individuals and our teams you know, as they start to do things, um, you know, and, and they, they start to experience different types of successes, um, if they want to participate in a competition or an event outside of Hong Kong or, you know, uh, different parts of Hong Kong, we definitely want to um, be able to support that. So those are things, just three examples of ways that we see us being able to expand experiential learning. All right. And I think, um, last question that we'll do today, um, is uh, any plans to introduce a new language to students? So um, yes, so hopefully that was um, made clear from the, the presentation that yes, we do, we will be, what we're, what we're calling like a world language uh, would be an opportunity for students beginning in sixth grade. And that's whether they're in the dual language or the international stream, they would be able to have the opportunity to start taking on um, a new language. Uh, and so again, now that new language, um, it may be Spanish, um, maybe Korean, you know, those are just two, two that are coming up, you know, just from, from what we've already been hearing from students' interest. Um, but we'll, we'll, that's something that we'll kind of continue to gauge more and more of the students' interest to make sure that we can offer um, those language classes that students are most interested in learning. All right. So um, thank you uh, very much for joining us this afternoon. We covered a lot of information um, and we know it was a, a fairly lengthy presentation, uh, but we do appreciate, you know, since we had the opportunity to bring the whole community together, there's been a lot of work happening, um, you know, behind the scenes and because we don't get to see as many of you as often as we would like, um, we really want to be able to take a chance to just pause and reflect on the, on the, what's already happened and been accomplished, but also really start to look ahead. Um, and so I also, I, I definitely want to thank our five directors who joined us today. So thank you, um, Peggy, Eva, Helen, Cherry, and Yat. I uh, really appreciate, um, you know, you taking the time to, to join the session, and, but also for the, the, the incredibly hard work that happens behind the scenes to make all of these, uh, these dreams possible.
。好啊、呃，非常感谢大家参加我们今天的这场线上讲座哈。啊、呃，那我们也呃想利用这个机会，特别的感谢我们的董事会的成员啊，因为他们在幕后做了很多呃辛苦的工作哈、啊，是我们在呃前面看不到的。呃，而且他们对学校这种一一如既往的支持，也让我们非常的感动。那我们相信有他们作为强大的后盾，呃，那我们的学校一定会越办越好。呃，那家长朋友们，如果今天参加这场讲座还有一些问题是我们没有回答到的，或者您有很多还有一些新的问题，呃，那您可以呃之后呃通过邮件啊、呃、跟我们学校联系，我们继续为您解答，好吧？谢谢大家。Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you very much. And if you have any, feel free to contact Dr. Du and I. We'll be happy to help.、Um, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye, Sean. Bye, Charlie. Bye, Peggy. Bye, Nancy. Bye. Bye bye.